best friends you had from Well, school? one was Glenna Fay, was my Uncle Reuben's a daughter. He married late in life, so he had a daughter about my age. We, we were just a, a few months apart. And the other one was uh, Betty Lois Parsley. She was Uncle Carl's uh, Uncle, Uncle Carl's. Um, let's see. Her mother was Uncle Carl's sister. Her mother ran ran the little country store up on the highway. And uh, Betty was a real smart girl. Uh, she married. They moved to California in late years. She worked for the president of the university at Riverside, and just always was very capable and smart, and she's still living there, um, near there. Glenna Fay became a nurse, and she lives in um, Beaumont, Texas, and has just retired, and she was a good nurse, I'm sure. And I became a teacher and what kind of things did you do together as friends? I don't know. I think we did stuff like we played house. We'd go out and make us a playhouse, you know, and we'd play house. Pretend that I'm going to go to town and do this now, and pretend I'm doing this. <laughs> and we'd take pine straw and make the walls of the house and fix it up. and. Or we made a playhouse where we put real little boards and sticks and chairs and stuff in it, and um, we did stuff like that. We we only lived. If you walked straight across, it probably was only a mile across, but we never. That was a long ways for us, so we never got to see each other all the time. But so, uh, but Glen Fay was a. She was. Uh, she got uh, scarlet fever when I was about nine, somewhere between ten and twelve. I think she got scarlet fever, and um, that we that really worried us. And uh, but uh, her hair came all out, but came back curly. Mm -hmm. She had curly hair the rest of her life. Good, pretty, natural curly hair, and she lived. She did fine. She just did fine. Uncle Reuben was one of the most interesting characters in the whole country, her daddy. And that's a whole story by itself. Uncle Reuben uh, was a very, very bright person. He had taught school, I believe, at one time. And he was in the lumber business, the tree business, like many people are there in Arkansas. and. Um, he, he loved politics, and even when I was a little old girl and didn't even know what in the world he's talking about, I'd go over to see Glenify while I was waiting for her to do something. He'd say, well, Billy, what do you think about this government now? <laughs> and he'd start in on it. I was always amazed that he would ask me any question about it. But I did, I did appreciate him so much, and I made the tape that has his voice on it, you know. Do you have any teachers that made a good impression on you in, at the Barndale School? Uh, we had one we called Miss Julia. Uh, she came down from Little Rock and taught us for a year or two. I remember her. We had one that came from the Queen area. Her name was Laurel, Laura. Thing. Her sister and her came over and lived together, and she taught school for us. And I just don't remember a lot about school. It was easy for me. We uh, we looked forward to recesses, and we had a great old big wood stove in the middle of the floor, and it must have been cold. We had to walk over there and slush through the snow. and. Rain. It seemed like it snowed and was worse weather back then than it has been more re in recent years. And we would, um, we had an outdoor toilet we had to go to down the hill from the school. And um, 
do sort of set the standard for style and a good appearance? Well, our Aunt Florence. Aunt Florence had a special talent, kind of an art talent. She always wanted to be building and fixing the house, changing the furniture. Um, she got my dad involved. They went up and built a room on the back of the church. The one, it was just a one room church, you know, before. And she got dad to go up there and they built that room, put a bathroom in, in the back. And then uh, Aunt Florence, I don't know how she did it, but she had a great influence on us. She always seemed glad to see us come. She was just always so nice to us. And you felt like that she didn't mind that you came to visit, you know, and took her time or anything. And she always dressed herself nicely. She made her own dresses. One time she made the whole dress, saw that she had made the wrong side of the material, took it all apart, and made it back again. She always looked nice, and she saw to it that their, her daughters looked nice, too. And having a church there that talked about colleges and schools and foreign places probably was what motivated us to try to go to school and make something out of us. I've thought about that at times. What was it? What was the one element that pushed us up and made us so different from other little country places. Mm -hmm. But it was that uh, it was going to church and learning about uh, going off to, to being educated, I believe. You know, after we kids got through school, some of the mothers now could go to school, and some of the grown mothers left their houses, the kids are out, like Verma, Verma Ewing, Margie Ewing, and um, one or two more. They went over to Arkadelphia and got their degree in teaching. Verma, who lived way back <clears throat> off the highway, had married young, had three boys, and um, but she had a bright mind, and she wanted to go to school, wanted to learn more. And when her last boy, or her oldest boy maybe it was, and her last one probably, got on the bus, she went out and got on the bus too, and went to high school with those kids and finished her high school. Then she went and over to Arkadelphia, finished college. And then she was working on her doctorate degree when she came down with lupus and died. That's why I dedicated my doctoral thesis to her, because she would have been the first in the community to get a doctorate degree from among us. Now we had had an MD doctor or two come out of there, but we didn't have a doctor. But um, another fellow that lived, um, he was not, he didn't go to our, our church, but one of the um, sheets lived over beyond us, that big uh, sheets farm that Vita's um, um, husband bought just next to my land. Um, one of his sons um, got a doctorate degree, I believe, because he was a superintendent of schools. And then uh, one of the bright boys, um, another generation down from me nearly, uh, he, I understand, got a doctorate degree. But we never thought about it earlier. I never meant to. It just came. Uh -huh. And uh, but um, school was important, and we we heard we had a mission story every week at church. You could go as a missionary and do something good. Uh, Aunt Florence uh, 
would get me to memorize something and, and get up front and say it. I remember once she handed me something to memorize after I was sitting down in Sabbath school. <laughs> and in the, you know, it is. And she came back and said, Billy, she said, I wonder if you'd try to say this point. So I sat there and memorized it mostly and got up there and said it for I can memorize so easily a page or two even I could memorize. And so uh, that helped us. Aunt Florence Hunuk was gently pushing us and getting up front and doing things. It helped us. It was tremendous. She was a great influence in many lives there. And after we were all gone and her husband was gone, he died so early in his 50s, uh, she used to go around at night and visit people. She, I meant she had to go back to her house in the dark, you know, but she'd go visit mother, and she'd go visit other people that were alone. Wonderful person. And, uh, did, you, um, did you ever get in trouble at school or at home? I yeah I I got in trouble at home some um, one time we kids decided we'd go looking for some kind of flower I think you know we would do these um, things where you'd learn all the different flowers of the neighborhood or something like that and well anyway whatever it was we went walking out about back back of the school and down in the woods there and I was late coming home and mother got nervous <laughs> and she met me with a switch in her hand when I got back to to um, Patsy Dillard's place there was mother with a switch in her hand and she was really upset and I I was I think I had a bicycle at that time daddy bought me a bicycle finally then he sold it when he got ready to, <laughs> when I went off to college. He sold my horse, too, but that wasn't... And he bought them all. I guess he thought he could sell them, you know. <laughs> yeah. And so was, was Grandma the disciplinarian or Grandpa? Oh, yeah. Gram well, Grandpa was really the... He, he was... When he said it, you meant... He meant it, you know, and we, he didn't have to tell us but once. One day he heard me say a bad word. It wasn't a very bad word. <laughs> well, someone, we were walking around the house, and he was in the bedroom, and the window was up. And, as I, and the old um, dog or something was bother, bothering us, and I said, I think I said doggone, you old dog, gone dog or something like that. And Daddy heard me, Billy? You don't say that word. <laughs> I never did again. <laughs> he wasn't as particular about himself, but he's going to make sure that we did. And I think I got the name Billy because he really would like to have had a boy. You know, he had two girls, and, and so I got Billy. I probably would have been Billy if I were a boy. You know, see, Billy... We, we had a Bill Lambert anyway, later, <laughs> on the other family. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so he, he kind of held a different standard for his kids than for himself? In like what area? Well, he didn't go to church. He didn't go to church for years. Mm -mm. And later, after he <clears throat> started kind of going to church, um, and and he smoked for years. He smoked, and um, he um, he used to, he used his words that he needed <laughs> to get through life. But then he um, they had a big revival meeting, and some of those men who had fallen by the wayside, so to speak, joined the church. One was Daddy, I think um, Henry, and. Um, See, I can't remember who all. Maybe, and I was bab I was going to be baptized, and they made the call, you know, and I was way over here, and Daddy was over there, and I just knew my Daddy had to get baptized, <laughs> and so I walked over there, and and he probably saw it coming, 
And I said, Daddy, I want you to get baptized. And he said, I'm not, re I'm not ready, Billy. And I just stood there. But after a while, <laughs> he gave in, and he, he, he was baptized. Yeah, a whole bunch of us were baptized at that time. Glenna Fay and Betty. Revival meeting or evangelistic Yes, it was eventually came. Yes, it was, um, if you give me enough time, I could think of their names. Maybe two men came down and, and did that. And they had a real good success. When was it? Seemed like it was around 1942. But I'm have to look it up. I've got my certificate somewhere. And that, was, uh, that was Grandma during the time before Grandpa got on board. It was she was a, a practicing Christian. Yeah. And how did she she worry about Grandpa, or how did she relate to him? On well, I'm matters? sure she. I I don't remember her saying anything to him or not to him about it, but I'm sure she must have. She went to church all the time, and I don't know how um, Mother became a Christian. Grandma became a Christian somehow along the way, Grandma. And Mother was brought up as an Adventist, I believe. Mm-hmm. I'd like to tell you about the oil field. Okay. Um, folks were having a hard time up in the country. The depression was coming on. Jobs were hard. They were just in the country. You know, you always had your firewood, and you had your gardens and your canned food, but you just didn't have anything else. You couldn't pay your taxes with your canned goods. <laughs> you couldn't pay Dr. Bremer <laughs> with your canned goods. I, mean, I think some of them did, though, with various things. And um, just about that time of the oil boom of, of in El Dorado came in, and uh, Daddy went down. And he came back, uh, he, Grandpa went with him, or maybe Grandpa came a little later. Grandpa then moved his whole family down there, Grandma and Grandpa Lambert, and probably Uncle Hack, and whoever was uh, the, um, the cripple girl, um, Pat, Pat, all of them went down. Grandma ran a boarding house for the men that would come down from the country. They'd come and she'd have a cot for them and cook for them. And she said she almost uh, broke down doing that. It was such hard work, you know. Uh, well, you know, they didn't have automatic washing machines, I don't think, and she had to wash and clean and do everything. This is Grandma Lambert? This is Grandma Lambert. Lambert. And, but they made good money and it got them all through the Depression. Mother says they didn't even notice there was a Depression. She and Daddy. She didn't realize that Grandma Wallace was having such a hard time up on the farm, though. Grandma just had a little piece of land somewhere, and she, with Uncle Buddy, were trying to plow and make a garden, raise a crop. And she found Grandma wearing men's shoes and Mother said in later years, oh, she said, I didn't know that Mama was having such a hard time. I didn't realize it. She could have helped her, you know, so much. But she just didn't know about it. So we did real well and until Daddy got his leg caught in the uh, drilling. They were drilling a, a, an oil well and they always had a big truck at the back that pulled the tubing up, and they would attach the truck with a strong uh, chain on each side of the 
well and this would hold the truck down because when you're pulling tubing up out of the well the truck would you know have a lot of pressure on it well one of those chains broke and the truck flipped over and daddy was the one sitting up there running the machinery and it caught his leg so grateful it didn't catch someplace else you know but it caught his um i think it was the left leg wasn't it <laughs> left leg below the knee but then uh, the um then the gangrene set in it they had to cut it off and then they um they cut it off had to eventually cut it off above the knee didn't they but we girls loved our daddy and he was to us just fine that way or any other way we just thought he was the cat's meow and uh, we uh, he was good to us so after daddy lost his leg they decide to go back to the farm for him to heal and to learn to use an artificial limb well daddy was you know rambunctious hard worker he thought he could just put that leg right on and start walking but he put it on and it, it didn't go that way <laughs> he had to practice and learn to use it but after that he just went anywhere and did anything one day he was working down by one of the big oak trees out to the back of the house and uh, he had that artificial leg kind of laying out one way to beside him you know and he was working and he looked over there and if there wasn't a, um, a snake right there near his artificial limb <laughs> we said well, we're glad it was the artificial limb over there he could get through some things we did and it was one of those old bad snakes too and so, um, but he would go um, ride the tractor. He kept his, oh, he kept his farm just so neat. He wanted it all clean. He would mow it down, keep the fence up. Wanted the place to look nice, and it did. He had black Angus cattle in there. It was so pretty to look out to the green pasture with all those black Angus cattle out there. And he bought the land all the way across to the church. And so he had a lot of room for his cows. And uh, one day I was visiting there, and he came in after he had been on the tractor. And uh, he called me, and I went to the kitchen where he and mother were. And he said, uh, he said, Billy, uh, Daddy's not going to be here much longer. And of course I started crying and sat on his knee we girls always sat. I was so young I could sit on his lap and I didn't want him to die and he said well I may make it a couple more years but he only made it six months when he died but God was so good mother was not a brave person you know and she lived there and took care of daddy and and uh, the night he died, the Lord uh, had it where Dick was there with Mother. And uh, Mother ran in. And you see, Daddy always kept nitroglycerin tablets on the nightstand by his bed, and he would wake up time and have to get one. This time he didn't wake up in time to get his nitroglycerin tablet. And Mother ran in and got Dick. Dick told me later that he gave Daddy um, artificial respiration and did everything he could, but he, there was no response. But at least he was there with Mother to help. That was wonderful. So I think about that, and I, I know the Lord will provide, you know, things like that for me too. Yeah. And... We we kept at those days they brought the the corpse home in the casket. casket and put them in the house and in the country way it was good to have um, the people would come and sit with you 
And so early the next morning, after they had brought Daddy, um, Alan Dillard, who lived just away, here he came. Well, you know, I was young. I didn't know the, the procedure, but he just came and sat down. And I realized it was the tradition that you don't leave the grieving people alone. You come and try to be with them. He just came and sat. Effie Revan came in and said, I want to see him. And she was rambunctious. And, and then she came in and looked at him. She said, oh, he said, well, he, he looked so good. He said, he, he was always just as friendly as a puppy. <laughs> and he was. He, Daddy was always. When I went off to my first job of teaching away from home, um, Daddy drove me down in a pickup truck to Texarkana for me to live with uh, this uh, widow lady, had a little room that she rented in her house. So one of the few things I could ever remember Daddy telling me to do, he said, Billy, he said, this lady is a widow, and you be careful how you use uh, uh, the water and everything, you know. So he had a real good heart. And yeah.